Good morning, everybody. Uh, like uh, Sam said, or somebody said, my name is Nick. My name is Nick Munis. I uh, had the privilege, my wife and I had the privilege of uh, being members of this church from 2019 to 2021. So we were here for about two, two and a half years. I served on Young Life staff here in Oxford, if you're familiar with that. Uh, so we, we had the joy of being here at this church, and, and we love this church. Something specific about this church that we remember uh, and that we were always encouraged by was how much of a family it feels when you're here. It feels like such a family, welcoming and, and inclusive. So we're, we're very thankful to be here. I'm super excited to be able to open God's Word with you guys this morning. So this morning, I'm going to be continuing in your guys' series in the book of Esther. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Esther chapter 9. Um, and, and I will warn you, Emmanuel went on vacation and gave me a passage that has some difficult things in it. So I'm excited to open up God's Word and for Him to, to speak to us here together. Um, and I understand now that it is, it is customary here to stand for the reading of God's Word. So I will read all of Esther chapter 9. So if you wouldn't mind also standing back up, get you a little calisthenics working. If you just sat down, we'll stand back up. And I'm going to read all of Esther chapter 9. So Esther 9 verses 1 through 32. <laughs> says this. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for fear of them had fallen on all the peoples. And the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parshandatha, and Dalphon, and Espatha, and Paratha, and Adalia, and Eridatha, and Parmashatha, and Erisai, and Eridai, and Viazatha. The ten sons of Haman, son of Hamandatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they laid no hands on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king, and the king said to the queen Esther, in Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the 10 sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day in the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives, and got relief from their enemies, and killed seventy-five thousand of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar. And on the fourteenth day they rested and made that a day of fasting, of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the thirteenth day and on the fourteenth, and rested on the fifteenth day, making that a day of fasting and gla feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who lived in the royal town in the rural towns hold the fourteenth day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obligating them to keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and also the 15th day of the same, year by year. As the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned from them, from sorrow into gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting, of, of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts to, of food to one another, and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, son of Hamandatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them. 
they had cast per, that is, cast lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged in the gallows. Therefore they called these days Purim, after the term Pur. Therefore, because of all that was written in his letter, and of what they had faced in this matter, and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them, that without fail they would keep these two days, according to what was written at the time appointed every year, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, in every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai, the Jew, gave full written authority, confirming the second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews into the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus in words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them, and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring. With regard to their fasts and their lamenting, the command of Queen Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Would you pray with me as we open up God's word together uh, to study and hear what he has to say to us? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word, that it is true and that it is good. Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom, and by your Spirit, you would teach us everything you want us to know about you and about us. Lord, open our hearts to understand your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Revenge is an interesting thing, isn't it? We've all desired revenge in some way in our life. When we were wronged, maybe in school, we wanted to get back at that person. Or maybe if you're a parent and you saw somebody push, a, another kid push your kid to the ground in the playground. You have that natural inclination within you to get back at that kid. You might want to go up and push them down yourselves, right? Revenge is an interesting thing. And another place where revenge is present is the literary and cinematic world of Harry Potter. You might be familiar with Harry Potter, but if you're not, at the beginning of the first book or movie, Harry Potter's parents get killed. They get murdered by an evil wizard. And throughout the entire book, the series of books, Harry is growing and he is learning about his parents. And he's understanding that, oh, my parents were murdered. They were killed. And he's feeling this sense of, I want to get back at this guy. I want to take him out. But, but he's, he's wrestling because there's morality there, and he's, he's struggling because he knows, is it wrong to want to kill him? Is it wrong to want to get back to him? Revenge is an interesting thing. How do we think about it biblically? How do we think about vengeance biblically? How do we respond as the people of God when we're faced with such opposition and trials? And this chapter in the book of Esther describes the people of God gaining mastery over those people who hated them, and they respond to it accordingly. So in some context, briefly, you guys, most recently in Esther chapter 8, you studied about Esther asking for mercy from the king. If you recall in Esther chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, um, and then eventually the king gave Mordecai the authority to reverse the edict. I'm pretty sure Emmanuel preached, uh, preached on that last week. The Lord reversed the edict. Uh, if you see in Esther 8, verses 10 through 12. I'm going to read it really quick. It says this, and, and Mordecai wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder the goods on one day throughout the provinces of King Ahasuerus. So the Lord reversed the edict, and then Mordecai had the ability to write a new edict. And this is the edict that he wrote. And so in our text here, we see how this edict gets carried out. We see what happens in, this, in the people. And so and just to, to refresh us, what is this edict reversing? If you, if you turn back, if you're in your Bibles, Esther chapter 3 is important for us to read for this text. 
Esther chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, you remember Haman in Esther chapter 3 had this edict that he went out to kill the Jews. And this is what it said. I'll start reading in verse 8 and following. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in the provinces of your kingdom. The laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let, the decree that the, let, it, let, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they might put it in to the king's treasure, treasuries. So you see here, this is the edict that has been reversed. The edict, of, the edict that Haman had set out in order to kill and annihilate the Jews. And so in our text, the first half describes the deliverance, the edict being reversed, and the second half describes the response. So the deliverance is an example of God's vengeance. You'll see in verses 1 through 16, God's vengeance. If you look down in verses 1 through 5, just briefly, the Jews gain mastery over them. No one could stand against the Jews. Mordecai became famous when he was recently on the other side of that. He was in sackcloth and ashes, if you'll recall, from earlier on in the book. And then if you look down again in verses 13 through 16, Haman's sons are hanged in the gallows. The Jew killed thousands of people who were against them. So this might be, this is interesting, but what, what are prompting these events? Why has all this murder happened? Well, if you look down in, in, in Esther 8, verses 13, it tells us, in chapter 8, verse 13, the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies to take vengeance on their enemies. We generally don't think of vengeful as an attribute of God. We don't think, oh, God's vengeful. He, is, he's, he's, he will enact revenge on others. But if you look in God's word, there's many places that he's described that way. Uh, uh, one in particular, Psalm 94, verses 1 through 3, says this, O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, O judge the earth, repay the proud, what they deserve. And then God is also speaking in Deuteronomy 32, 35 through 36, where he says, vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly for the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he will see that their power is gone and there is none remaining bond or free. So the word vengeance is interesting. It's hard to understand. But vengeance comes from the Latin root word vindicare, which is the same Latin root word for the word vindicate. So vengeance and vindication are similar words, right? And this is crucial to understanding God's vengeful actions in this text. Though these actions seem vengeful and, and harmful, God is vindicating his people. What is vengeance exactly? Vengeance at its core is righting a previous wrong. Vengeance at its core is righting a previous wrong. It is wrong that Haman wanted to kill the people of God. It is wrong that Haman wanting to, was casting lots to try to take them out. That is wrong. And we see, we see clearly all over Scripture that God writes wrongs. God writes wrongs, specifically wrongs that are done to his people. Wrongs done to his people, it is clearly all over Scripture that God will vindicate his people. He will have vengeance on those who oppose him. He will have judgment on those who oppose him. God, in this text, even particularly vindicates Mordecai, right? Mordecai, in chapter 4, verse 1, I mentioned before, was, had on sackcloth and ashes, tearing his clothes because his people were going to die. But now he has a place of authority. You can see the vindication there the personal vindication of Mordecai. It's not clear what motivates Mordecai's actions here in these texts, but through the vindication, God preserves his people. Emmanuel talks about that in chapter 8. God preserves his people. He honors his covenant with his people that he doesn't have with others. Only with his people he has a special covenant. God's judgment on his enemies through these events are right because God allows for them to happen. He had to preserve his covenant people, particularly in order for the line of David to eventually produce King Jesus, right? Remember, Emmanuel talked about that last week, that the line of David had to be preserved for Jesus to come. 
It's difficult for us, though, morally, to understand these events. It's difficult for us to look at the people of God murdering others. It's hard for us to comprehend that morally. So how do we understand this in light of Scripture, in light of where we are as Christians on this part of redemptive history? How do we look at this text and understand it? There's differing interpretations around the morality of this book, and I'm sure Emmanuel's gotten into it with you all. But it's hard to argue that these events are 100% positive, right? Lots of people get murdered in, in Esther chapter 9. But we must start by clarifying that the morality of these events are not the main point. The main point of these events are God's ven- vengeance, deliverance, and vindication of his people. That's why he had to do this. You saw throughout, you've seen throughout this entire book that these people were plotting against the Jews, against the people of God that would eventually produce Christ. And we look at it now and we see, oh man, murder, that's difficult, and that's absolutely valid to see it that way. But we have to remember that God's deliverance and his vengeance are the main point. The request by Esther and Mordecai, just to briefly discuss this morality, the, the, the request in chapter 8, verse 5, was for Haman to revoke the letters that he had, if you'll recall. But then Mordecai wrote in the edict that he wanted to kill and annihilate and destroy the enemies of the people of God, those who might attack him on that day, those who might attack the Jews, including the women and children. I think it's okay to morally not understand this. It's okay to be challenged and to be confused on how, this, how does this work morally. And then you'll even recall at uh, chapter 9, verse 14, Esther, after the first day of killing, requested for a second day of killing. Requested for a second day of killing and for permission to hang her enemies in the gallows. The singular day of killing from the first edict seems calculated to me. It seems calculated that the people of God, okay, on one day you're allowed to defend yourselves, Right? So that second day of killing, it it appears that Esther is is acting like her enemies in some way. She might be acting like the people that she sought to to be against. God and his provision and protection of the Jews makes it so they do not get killed by their enemies, and that is good. But their sin causes them to respond in a morally challenging way, in a morally questionable way. And a, a, a picture to maybe make sense of this. Let's say Maria, my wife, and I are walking on the street, and somebody comes up to us and says, hey, I'm going to murder you in two days. I'm going to come and murder you and your wife. It would be morally difficult for me to go and murder him, right, if he never attacks me. So if two days come and I'm fine, safe in my house, if I go and I'm, I'm going to take this guy out because he might get me and my wife, right, that, that would be difficult to do morally. It's not a perfect example but it kind of gets this illustration of where is that morality. But again, we must clarify in this text the importance of God's sovereignty and our responsibility. There are other places in the Old Testament where God judges his enemies through immoral people. There's other places throughout the text. You'll recall the conquest in Joshua, just for one example. And there's other places as well where the morality is questioned. But we cannot forget that God is morally flawless. He is perfect. And these events do not stain his reputation. These events do not make him, put blame on him. He is perfect. In fact, they bring him glory. These events bring God's glory because God, in his power and in his vengeance, is saving his people. And that brings glory to God. It's it's okay to not understand this. It's okay to not understand it. God's judgment must come upon the enemies of his people. In the end, God's holiness will be on display too. On the last day, God's holiness will be displayed when his enemies are judged. We must trust that God is in control of the situation and his control today. We all know we're morally flawed. You and I are sinful. We make mistakes. Yet God uses us because of his goodness and his mercy towards us, even though we are not morally perfect either. It's okay as Christians to wrestle with this. It's okay to not understand. But how, but how should we look at revenge? How should we look at vengeance and revenge now, biblically? There was a, uh, a time when I was, I was young. I guess I'm still young. I don't know. Maybe. Teach his own, I guess. There was a time when I was a kid, and I was playing football with some of my friends outside. And 
I, uh, I tackled somebody who had the ball. I think I was just in my tackling of him. I don't think I was wrong. I don't think I did anything bad. But then he stood up. We looked at one another. We, we locked eyes. And he kicked me very hard where you do not want to be kicked, if you understand what I'm saying. And I cried and cried and cried. I was seven years old. It was terrible, right? But he sought vengeance on me. He had revenge. He wanted to get me back for tackling him in football, right? So it comes back to that inner, that in, internal, oh, man, I got to get back at that guy, right? Sin causes us to desire personal vengeance when we are wronged. We want to right the wrong. And in a lot of ways, this makes us, we're like God in this way. God wants to right wrongs, and so do we. We want to right wrongs. But when we are personally affected, we seek personal vengeance and personal revenge. Another way to, to maybe think about vengeance is um, the desire for something bad to happen to somebody else when they do wrong to us, right? So maybe I don't want to seek vengeance on that person, but maybe I hope they get pulled over on the way home from work. Or I hope that something happens at home, or I hope that whatever, whatever negative thing could happen to them. That's vengeance. That is revenge. You want that person to, to you want the wrong to be righted in your life. And the desire for revenge could also cause us to harbor bitterness and hold grudges with people. This is something that I struggle with. Our selfish hearts focus narrowly on circumstances, and we fail to see the bigger picture. And we must remember that vengeance is not for us. Vengeance is to be left up to God. God is the vindicator. God is the one who is allowed to have just vengeance to protect his people. A few passages speak on this, but Jesus specifically in Matthew 5, if you'll recall, when he says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. So Jesus kind of reestablishes that, that law in the Torah of an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. I'm saying no. When you're slapped, turn the other cheek. Revenge is not for you. We are to love those who are against us. We are to love them. And further, we must remember that oppression will come. The world is not perfect. Relationships will hurt you. You will be wronged in the same way that the Jews were wronged here. You will be wronged by others. So how should we act? Well, really quick, a key vet verse here, if you want to flip to Romans chapter 12. I'm just going to read briefly a couple verses from this. And, uh, as members of the new covenant, as Christians, we have a supernatural ability to live differently when we are wronged. So Romans chapter 12, I'm just going to read verses 17 through 21. It says this, Paul is speaking, he says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So Paul here is exhorting the Romans that by the Spirit of God, they can live differently when they are wronged. They can live differently when they are wronged. There's four things that are in there. The first thing he says, live peaceably with all. Live peaceably with all. That's a radical way to live when we are wronged. And then he says, two, never avenge yourselves. You can probably think right now a time in your heart, maybe this past week, where you sought, you sought vengeance. Maybe it was on a child or a parent or a coworker or a neighbor. Or maybe you harbored that vengeful attitude in your heart where you wanted them you wanted something to happen to them. You wanted to get back at them. But then number three, we are to leave vengeance to the wrath of God. Those Deuteronomy verses are cited here by Paul. He's citing that, that vengeance is for the Lord. It's not for you. And then fourth, reiterating the words of Jesus, we're supposed to go beyond to serve our enemy. We're supposed to go beyond to serve our enemy. So, so by the Spirit of God, the supernatural Holy Spirit enables us as Christians to live differently differently. 
we can live differently in light of when we are wronged. One commentator put it this way, personal grievances are not to become motivation for violent acts of vengeance. Personal grievances are not to become motivation for violent acts of vengeance. And we must remember that our hearts are still at war. In Christ, we are freed from the power and the penalty of sin. But we are not freed from the presence of sin. There's sin that is still around us and is in our hearts. You can see that very clearly in Esther. That there was some motivation. We don't know the motivation behind these people to annihilate the Jews. And there, and there are things like holy war that happen in the, in the Old Testament where there is just war and there's reason why it's okay to defend yourself. But, it's, but, but now in Christ, we are able to live differently. We will continue to feel that pull of vengeance in our hearts. We will continue to feel that. But in Christ, we have the power to live as he teaches. But we can't do it on our own, remember. We have the Holy Spirit and God to guide us through this. When someone wrongs us, we should take a breath and ask the Lord to give you a peaceful heart and a trusting attitude that he will deliver you from your oppression the same way that he does here to the, to the Jews. We can ask ourselves a couple of questions about this to think about. Is there a place in your heart right now where you want to get revenge on someone? Is there a place in your heart where you want to get revenge? Are you trusting in God's deliverance and God's vindication over your circumstances? Are you trusting in God's deliverance and God's vindication over your circumstances? Or are you holding a grudge against someone? Are you bitter towards another person? So the second half of this text here talks about the response to God's vengeance. God's vengeance is the beginning. But how should we respond to God's justice and vindication? Well, here in the text, you see the Jews do it through remembrance. They do it through remembrance. And the second half of our text encourages us in this way, if you'll see in verses 17 through 32. Uh, if you look down at verses 17 through 19, you see the Jews rested and feasted and were glad because they were safe, because the Lord had vindicated them. The Lord had delivered them. And, and these two different days that they were supposed to remember the events. That's why there's two different days here on the 13th and the 14th, and then uh, they were supposed to remember. And if you look down at verses 20 to 21, Mordecai recorded these things and sent the letters to all the Jews who were in the provinces of King Ahasuerus. So Mordecai, with his new authority, sends it out to tell everybody, hey, you've got to remember that this happened, right? And we don't know all the motivation behind Mordecai's actions here, but we do know that he wants the, Jew, the Jewish people to remember these events, to remember the days of deliverance. And then you see at the end of the chapter, if you look at 29 through 32, kind of that last three, that Queen Esther, the new queen, kind of seals it, that this is going to be a Jewish holiday. And, and it's called the Feast of Purim. And the Feast of Purim is, is kind, of, kind of redeeming that word pur, which was back in, in chapter 3 where Mordecai, or I'm sorry, where, where Haman cast lots to kill the Jews. Um, and, and, and they're kind of redeeming that and calling the feast Purim. The term Purim is there in verse 26. And the Jews, Jews actually still celebrate this festival today. I think it's in March. I think it's a Jewish holiday that is still celebrated. And we see further also that Haman's evil heart is crushed by God. If you look down in verse, 20, in verse, verse 25, excuse me, that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head. Should return on his own head and that he, his son should be hanged in the gallows. We must know that this is justice. This is justice. Haman was an evil man who wanted to end the Jews living in Persia. He wanted to end the Jews. Haman is God's enemy and God is judging his enemy rightly. It's amazing to see how God vindicates his people in all these specific ways. If you think about Haman, and then you see Mordecai, like we mentioned, and the casting of lots, you also can see that, that God is redeeming in his own way. His hand is all over this. The theme in Esther of God working behind the scenes is relevant. That's kind of a theme of the book of Esther, that, that God's name is not mentioned, but you can clearly see that God is orchestrating the events. But it's interesting here that, that we must recall that God is having vengeance on his enemies. 
He saved his people. So they're remembering the days of death and murder. So it's hard, again, morally to understand that, but we must remember that the, the broader theme here is the deliverance. So how are we supposed to remember these events today? Or any time something like this occurs in Scripture where there's people that are murdered and the, the people of God are supposed to remember? Well, we are to remember God more than the events. We are to remember God, the Deliverer, and the Vindicator more than the events. That God has vengeance on his enemies. In the Old Testament, the people of God are given the command to remember the Lord over and over again. Remember the Lord. A few places that we see this in Scripture where God's people are commanded to remember him, delivering them. If you recall in Genesis 9, the flood, God sets a rainbow in the sky, right? And the, and the rainbow is there for God to remember his covenant and for the people to remember God every time they see that rainbow. Remember God and his covenant. And then you'll see in the Exodus and his deliverance to the promised land that God is faithful to give his people a land. And they constantly say, remember that he, the Lord, is the one to be faithful and fulfill his promises. He was the one to deliver them from their enemies. And then again, uh, before Esther, the people of God are about to be sent to exile by ba to Babylon. And, and Isaiah is prophesying, particularly Isaiah 28, verse 6, they're about to be exiled, and Isaiah says this. God is telling them to sing, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desires of our soul. So they are saying, we're going into exile. The Lord knows. Okay, the Lord is going to be faithful to deliver them, but if you're people, you could easily focus on the circumstances. But Isaiah says, remember the Lord, that he will deliver you. And then now, ultimately, as Christians we can remember Christ. We can remember that Christ delivered us on the cross. Christians are to set our ultimate remembrance on Calvary, where Jesus was crushed on our behalf. We all know, and we can clearly see in this text, that because of our sin, God should take vengeance on us. You see, in the beginning, God created the world perfectly, but we turned away from him in our sin. And we turned away and desired to live our own way. We wanted to live apart from God. And we deserve separation for, from God and judgment because of that. But we deserve to be the object of God's wrath in the same way that the enemies of the Jews in this text are the enemies of God. We were the enemies of God. But as Christians, God in his mercy sent his son, Jesus, to die the death that we deserve, to live the perfect life, and die, die in our place. So that if we repent of our sins and trust in him, we can remember that he has delivered us. And ultimately, in the end, we will be in heaven with God. We know that we have sinned and fallen short of his glory. God is perfect and he demands this perfection. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is the reversal occurs. The reversal occurs. The same way in this text, the reversal occurs. The Jews were about to be killed, but God in his mercy saved them. God in his mercy vindicated them. And that's the gospel. We are naturally God's enemies, but we are made his friends by the blood of Jesus. We are naturally his enemies, but we are made his friends by the blood of Jesus. In Jeremiah chapter 31, one of my favorite uh, chapters in scripture, God foretells of the new covenant where Christ will come and will save his people. And God says in Jeremiah 31, 34, For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. And will remember their sin no more. God does not remember our sin if we are in Jesus. If we go to Christ and repent and ask for forgiveness, he forgets our sin. He will not remember it anymore. So the theme of remembrance here is redeemed for all of those who are in Christ, for those who turn and trust in him. The implications of this are staggering. We often dwell on sin, don't we? When we sin, we think about it. It, it replays in our brain. We, we think about it for days and weeks sometimes. Oh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I made that mistake again. I can't believe I fell short again. Maybe you are deeply troubled by sin and you can't forget it. Have you confessed it? 
to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We receive in, our, in this confession the joy and gladness like the festival in Purim. When we confess our sins to Christ, we receive joy and fullness and hope and gladness, the opposite of what we deserve, the great reversal like in this text. We will no longer be the subject of God's wrath eternally, and we will dwell with Christ in the heavenly places. Uh, a key verse that, that I would encourage you to write this down maybe this week to think about this verse. 2 Timothy 2.8 summarizes this meditation well. Paul is encouraging Timothy, the young pastor, and he says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Do you spend time every day remembering Christ? Do you remember that he has vindicated you, taken vengeance on your sin so that you can live rightly with him? Are you more concerned with your present circumstances than on the truth of your status before God? He has vindicated you. He has saved you in Christ. Is there a sin area in your heart that you believe God won't forget? I would encourage you today to confess your sins to our good God, and he will forgive you. Or something in particular, as you gather at church on Sundays. Do you remember when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper? What does he say? He says, do this in remembrance of me. When you take the Lord's Supper at church, do you remember Christ? Do you remember that he ultimately vindicated you and delivered you from sin? <clears throat> so to conclude, how does this section of Esther make sense to us today? How do we morally look at this and understand? How do, we, how do we figure it out? We must know that God was delivering the Jews through the reversal of this edict. Verse 22 says it well. Verse 22 says, Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending of food to one another and gifts to the poor. We must remember that God's provision and vindication of his people is on full display, even though the Jews in the story seem to be focusing on the events and, and the circumstances and what's happening. We must remember that God delivered his people through these events. We must theologically understand that vengeance is of the Lord and personal revenge is not for the people of God. And in our place in God's redemptive history, we have the privilege of remembering Christ, our risen Savior, who has been punished on our behalf. Christ, who has forgotten our sins, nailed them to the cross. Christ, who delivers us from our enemies. We should remember these events of Purim as being crucial to God's plan to bring a Savior into the world, a Savior from the line of David that will save his people. We should remember these events, but we should remember Christ so much more. Christ, the ultimate vindicator, the ultimate deliverer of us, the true Savior. Our final hymn will help us remember this truth. The verse from our final hymn, it says, And when I think that God, his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Let's pray. Father, in your goodness, you vindicated the Jews. You had vengeance on their enemies to save them so that you could establish the greater vindicator, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. And Father, we pray that this week we can remember Jesus Christ. We can remember these events that they ultimately led and pointed to you. Father, help us this week to trust in you more. Help us to confess our sins to you, our good God. Help us to not harbor revenge in our hearts or bitterness towards others. And Lord, we pray that, that as we go from here, we would cherish Christ and love him more than we did when we came. In these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.